but most people are constantly looking for friends. We crave friendship in life, and uh, at times we all kind of stand frozen uh, with fear by the cemetery fence, uh, like those uh, boys, uh, like like the the young boy did. And uh, there's times where you know we can just barely muster a prayer, and we need friends in life. And uh, more than likely, you know the story of Saul's conversion very well here in Acts chapter nine. And uh, this morning, though, uh, sometimes we know these stories too well. And so let's look down through here and maybe take a little different uh, path at the story of Saul's conversion and try this morning to picture Saul's experience today from the vantage point of loneliness. Here in just a matter of three days, Saul became lonelier than he'd ever been. He's probably begging God for a friend. And we pick up Acts chapter 9, verse number 1 reading here, and Saul, yet breathing out threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. This is Saul. He's a religious man. Uh, He's a Jew, uh, but he's persecuting the Christians, those of the way uh, that Scripture mentions there. And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And he, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Saul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw no man. But they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And he was three days without sight, and neither did eat nor drink. Here Saul must have been uh, physically spent uh, when he neared Damascus. He'd been traveling some 120 uh, dusty, uh, hot, uh, rough miles to stop the church from growing there. That's Saul's mission, is to to end these uh, believers, these people that are following Jesus. As a religious Jew, uh, Saul does not like what these people of the way, these disciples of Christ, these Christians as we know them, were doing. And uh, just as the city uh, came into view where, where Saul was headed, he's hit with a, with a blinding light. And he has this Damascus Road experience where he meets Jesus. And we know that his life radically changes at this point. But uh, everything goes dark for Saul. He's blinded. He can't see. And everything remained dark. And he realizes with this, this powerful, this deafening statement from heaven that everything Saul had believed to be true was false. Jesus wasn't the enemy. He found out right there that Jesus is Lord. And in the darkness, Saul must have, you know, expected the very judgment of God when this happened. I mean, can you put yourself in Saul's place? Uh, What's happening to me? Uh, You know, I've been persecuting uh, the followers of this man. Uh, I've been blinded. I can't see. And the men that were with Saul, they kind of, not sure what to think about this. But God is about to reveal to Saul the power of a faithful friend. Here he is. In fact, Saul was about to not just meet one, but two faithful friends, uh, two of the best friends that Saul would ever have in his life. First, uh, the Lord commands him, as you read there in the chapter, the, the Lord commands uh, Ananias to go to Saul. That's the first friend that we're going to see this morning. And even though Ananias is frightened, he obeys and he becomes the first friend that, that Saul found in his new family of faith. And then the second friend that we find here is Barnabas. And Barnas, Barnabas became Saul's uh, his advocate and his friend in Jerusalem, if it wasn't for Barnabas, Saul might not have uh, met these frightened apostles that we'll see later on in this chapter. And Saul never got over these two friends that he found, Ananias and Barnabas. By uh, becoming faithful friends, these two men uh, were about to change the world and didn't even know it. 
what greater missionary has walked the face of the earth than the man we know as the Apostle Paul? Man who wrote such a great portion of the New Testament of Scripture. And it began by two men who just wanted to be a friend. And Saul never got over them. It's impossible to overstate the importance of being a faithful friend. And it's criti critically important that we are friends to the people in our lives. We're having a friend day today at church. An opportunity for us to be friends uh, to those around us. And by looking this morning at these irreplaceable friends in, in Saul's life, as he becomes a new believer in Christ, we're going to see five characteristics of a faithful friend. Number one, a faithful friend is there. Be there. As you begin to kind of think in your life about the friends that you have, good friends, people that you know are friends that you can count on, that you probably have already had some faces come to mind. And you, you know, you kind of think over the years of who those people have been. And they, you know, it, it could be a co-worker. It may be a, it may be a fishing buddy. Uh, it, it may be, uh, you know, somebody at the church. Somebody that you grew up with. But as we think about people that are true friends... How many times do those stories that we think about right now come to mind that when there was something happening in our life, true friends are always there, aren't they? The details kind of differ from story to story, but one thing is certain about faithful friends. They're there. And there's times when, when friends may be miles apart, and in a moment of need, a phone call, a text message, they'll drop what they're doing. They'll drive, fly, cross country, whatever they have to do to get to where you're at to be a faithful friend. But what if God asks you to befriend an enemy? Well, that's kind of different, isn't it? What if God asks you to become the friend of the person that's trying to persecute you that's trying to kill you, that's trying to stop the movement that you're a part of. Well, in half a dozen places in Scripture, here's one, Luke 6, 35, look at what Jesus said. Love ye your enemies, and do good, and lend, hoping for nothing again, and your rewards shall be great. What does Jesus say to do with our enemies? He says lend to them. Give them things. Don't ask for anything in return. Now here's Ananias. No doubt Ananias had a set of friends. He lives in Damascus. He's probably, he's probably read the paper. He's probably seen it on social media at this point. He's heard about this, this terrorist, Saul, that's looking to persecute and kill people like him. He's on the loose. And here comes God, here in Acts chapter 9. God says, hey, Ananias, I have a new friend for you. <laughs> Boy, I don't know about that. But before Ananias fully understood everything, notice, you know, he, he says to God, behold, I'm here. Here I am, God. He responds correctly to God in the beginning. He didn't know the details of it. He didn't even know the question, but he gives the correct answer. Ananias was willing to become a friend to the enemy despite his fear. And we'll see that there's power in a personal visit. God's going to send Ananias and Saul to connect face to face. And there's something about being there personal with someone, talking to someone face to face. Salespeople know it. Salespeople, if you look at the statistics... They make a lot higher volume of sales when they can meet face-to-face -face with someone than they can over the phone. How many of you enjoy getting telemarketing phone calls? But when you meet with someone face-to-face, -face, there's power in that. Faithful friends are, are there. So if you want to be a faithful friend, learn to be there. Ananias was there. God said, Ananias, here's a brand new guy. This man is brand new to the faith. And he's in a spot right now where he doesn't have any friends. 
He needs somebody. And Ananias was there. Second, if you want to be a, a faithful friend, if you want to understand the, the power of uh, being a faithful friend and the power of friendship, know the power of a gentle touch. If we look at every single culture around the globe, there is touch involved in greeting. Our culture is usually a handshake. Other cultures in this day, we read in Scripture, where they greeted one another with a holy kiss. And in some cultures, they still do that today. I read of a, I read of a pastor uh, that was preaching in a large Baptist church in Moscow, and uh, he had been invited to attend the deacon's prayer meeting before the service. And as the deacons were entering the room, the pastor stood there at the door and k- kissed every deacon on both sides of the cheek when they came in. And, uh, you know, many cultures, they do that. And that's their equivalent of a, of a warm greeting. Now, I'm glad we don't have to kiss in here this morning. Uh, handshake will do it for me. But a touch. It can show empathy. It'll show friendship. It shows trust. And look down at verse number 17. This is the gift that Ananias gives to Saul for the first time. Verse number 17, Ananias went his way and he entered the house putting his hands on him. When Here's Saul, lonely. Again, he's blind. He can't see. He's in total darkness, sitting in this house, a brand new believer, an enemy of the church. And here comes in, here comes in Ananias, puts his arm around him. Saul had come to Damascus to bind the hands of this man. And here we find the hands of this man instead using it to embrace Saul. And a kind touch is extended. He's had no food, he's had no drink for three days. He needed a friend. And before before Saul had heard a word from Ananias, who was a total stranger to him, before he knew the answers uh, to his questions, the first thing he felt was just a gentle touch on the shoulder. Someone who was there for him, a friend. A faithful friend understands that sometimes... Somebody just needs an arm around the shoulder. Sometimes when we, when we welcome in brand new believers to the faith, they don't need to be preached at. They don't need uh, a lesson in, in theology. They just need someone who will sit down and put their arm around them and tell them, I'm your friend. The power of friendship. Number three. The power of friendship, the power of being a faithful friend is knowing when to speak the right words at the right time. In in Scripture, uh, we know that Paul had more than one, or Saul had more than one name. His second name was Paul. That's a good guess, but it's actually wrong. That was our trick question. Look here in verse number 17 again. Ananias went his way. He entered into his house, putting his hands on him, said, Brother Saul. There's the second name we see for him. Brother Saul, the Lord, even Jesus, that appeared unto thee in the way as thou camest, hath sent me that thou mightest receive thy sight and be filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, it may not seem like a big deal to us, but Saul probably never forgot the day where he was sitting there, he was blind, he was lonely, he was scared, He didn't know what was going on. He was an enemy of the church. That man Ananias came in and put his arm around him. said, Saul, you're my brother. Wow. Ananias spoke the right words at the right time. What a gift. Faithful friends don't just say kind words, but we know when to say them at the right time. That's friendship. There's power in that. And Ananias begins to share the truth with Saul in a gentle way and instructs him that his next step is is to continue following the Lord and to be baptized. And the first person that that Saul heard the truth from was a God-sent friend. 
And Ananias showered Saul with some of the most precious gifts you can other, uh, give any other human being. He was, there for, he was there for Saul. He touched him, put his arm around him, spoke kindly to him, called him a brother, the right words at the right time. And over the next several days, he begins to teach Saul and he encourages Saul and he introduces him to more people who had that same touch and had that same kindness and the same love that was born of the Holy Spirit. And Ananias begins to introduce Saul to these people. And what wonderful power Saul discovered in the city of Damascus. And one of the first powers that he discovered was the power of faithful friends. If you want to be a faithful friend, don't waver in your support. In 1967, Stu Weber, he was in the U.S. Army Ranger School in Fort Benning, Georgia. And this was brutal training for brutal times. Some of you remember back in the 60s and what was going on. You got the war with Vietnam as a backdrop, and these young men are trying to survive the heat and the humidity and the rigors of, of training. And now, as a pastor and an author, Stu Weber writes of the day when that drill sergeant with a raspy voice began to bark out his first passionate speech to those young men. And he told them, You know, we're here to save your lives. He told him, you're headed for combat. But he said, we're going to see to it that you overcome all your natural fears. He said, we're going to, secondly, we're going to show you how much stress your body can endure. When we're finished with you, when you leave here, you're going to be the Army's best. You're going to be confident. You'll survive even in combat. Most importantly, you're going to, you're going to succeed in the mission that we send you to. And then before he dismissed the formation, the sergeant gave these recruits their first assignment. They're, you know, they're, they're thinking, we're going to go on a 10-mile on a hike. Uh, you know, we're going we're gonna to be in full battle gear. We're going we're gonna to go rappel down a, the face of a sheer cliff. The old tough drill sergeant, first thing he told them was, number one, your first assignments, find yourself a ranger buddy. You guys are going to stick together. You're not going to leave each other. You'll encourage each other. And if necessary, you'll carry each other. And that was their first assignment. It was the Army's way of saying, you know what? Difficult assignments, difficult circumstances require a friend. Together is better. And during the first week of Saul's spiritual training camp, he runs in not only to Ananias, but then here comes Barnabas. And he had no idea then that God had placed him next to the one man. I mean, this guy has already earned the nickname. Barnabas wasn't his name. Barnabas is his nickname. The church has nicknamed him Barnabas, the encourager. And God sends Saul and Barnabas together. And this is a, this is a ranger-type buddy that Saul needed to have. As Saul leaves Damascus and walks back to, to Jerusalem, he, he's learning everything that he could from the Christians who had... Who had been there and walked with him and, and I mean can you imagine the questions that Saul is asking he's a very religious man he's a, he's a scholarly man but he's trying to learn everything he can about this new Jesus that he's run into because he's on a different side now and so just imagine the questions that Saul's asking of these other followers of Jesus Christ he would have come to Capernaum as he was returning to Jerusalem I don't know, maybe they stopped and maybe he was shown the house. Here's, here's the house where, where Jesus has been. Maybe as they, as they make this trip back to Jerusalem, maybe they stop and maybe Saul's introduced to some of the men and women that had met the touch of the Master and had been healed at the hands of Jesus. Can you imagine Saul as he saw the light in the eyes of these people? how their lives had been so radically transformed by Jesus. Saul would have met people who had been continually changed by the power of Christ. And finally, he'd meet up with Peter and James and John and Simon and Thomas. And he'd sit down and, I mean, Saul would have so many questions for him. He'd pour over the... Uh, Saul knew the Scriptures... But now as Saul begins to pour over the scriptures, he's looking for every sign of Jesus that he can find in there. But when Saul gets back to Jerusalem, it's a ghost town. 
Look down at verse number 26. Every time Saul got close to tracking somebody down that he wanted to meet with, they're gone. And when Saul was come to Jerusalem, he essayed himself, uh, he essayed to join himself to the disciples. But they were all afraid of him and believed not that he was a disciple. I mean, it's understandable, right? The fear that they have of, of Saul. They know this man is a terrorist seeking to kill them. So uh, we, don't, we, don't, we don't quite trust this man. And it's at this point, Saul needs a friend to stand with him. And he didn't have far to look. Here's Barnabas, the encourager. He took him and he brought him to the apostles and he told them how, how Saul was on his journey and, and he'd met the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and he was in Damascus and he's preaching and, and uh, you know, he says that this man, has, has, he's, he's already done a 180 in just a short amount of time. He's speaking boldly in the name of the Lord, verse 27, verse 28 tells us. But Saul's new experience, Saul's newfound faith, it resulted in not many friends. All the people that were Saul's friends... They now see Saul as a traitor. Saul switched sides. So none of those people like him. And all the people on, on the side where, Paul, uh, where Saul's at now, they're scared of him because they don't really know what... Saul, he's finding himself with very few people that want to be around him. And like most new believers, Saul loses friends because they don't understand him. And that's why being accepted at church is so important. Pastor Tommy Heigel, he, he's, he wrote this. He said, probably the loneliest year of my life was the first year after I became a Christian. I, I immediately lost all my old friends because we no longer had anything in common. And it usually takes about a year or so to make new friends. Understand that when, when people come into the, into, the, into the faith and they come into this church and, and they have just met Jesus Christ and they begin making changes in their lives, they may get rid of some of the old friends that they had. They find themselves lonely, like Saul. They don't want to go back to the old friends that they were with. Either they don't want to be around the old friends and a lot of times the old friends don't want to be around them when their lives have changed, so they don't have anybody. We call this a church family, don't we? That's the time when you put your arm around the person, you call them brother, you call them sister, you say, welcome into the family, I'm your friend, I'm here for you. You'd be like Barnabas. I don't quite know about that person. Well, Barnabas didn't know a whole lot about Saul either, other than the fact he said, man, I've met Jesus, my life has changed, I need some help. Barnabas said, I'm here for you. That's a beautiful example that Barnabas was. And when a faithful friend stands up for you and vouches for you, doesn't waver in support, when you found a friend like that, you found a great source of power, haven't you? And if you are that friend, God's power is working through you. A faithful friend will stay with you. Barnabas' friendship, it wasn't short-lived, was it? Saul and Barnabas, they're friends for years. He goes, at this point, Saul goes off into Arabia. He's gone for about three years. He's training. He's studying. He's being prepared for the ministry that God has for him. Well, in time, the church begins to kind of wonder, hey, whatever happened to that old boy Saul? You know, he kind of showed up there for a while, and he's been gone for a few years. We ain't heard from him. He's probably back to killing people. Well, here's Barnabas. He says, let me go find him. Barnabas goes off, and he, he looks for Saul, and he brings him back to Antioch. Saul and Barnabas began a relationship as they travel from church to church. They stay together for a year. And beyond that year, they, they stay friends for a lifetime. They started churches together. They, they grew missionaries together. They stayed together in the midst of disagreement. But in short, Barnabas was the kind of friend that Saul needed. As Saul needed a friend that would stand with him and stay with him. And think about the way that Ananias and Barnabas helped change the world. Saul, who became Paul, would eventually become the most important missionary in Christian history, a leader, the equal of Peter and John and the early church, the most prolific writer in the New Testament. I mean, think about this. How many millions of Christians have been freed by the concept of salvation by grace through faith? How many marriages have been saved by the words found in 1 Corinthians chapter 13? the great love chapter. How many anxious hearts have been calmed by the peace that passes all understanding or the knowledge that 
God can work all things together for good. God has used those scriptural concepts now for centuries. For millions and millions of believers. I've been changed by those words. You've been changed by those words. And they were all written by this man, Saul. Now what would have happened had Ananias and Barnabas not been there to put their arms around Saul and embrace him when there were no other friends? Here's this man laying crumpled on the dirt in the outskirts of Damascus. This overwhelming and blinding light has, has knocked him down and, and the Savior has taken away his eyesight. And his spiritual foundation has been shaken completely from everything that he knew. I mean, imagine the emotional state that Saul found himself in. As Saul stumbles into the city, he doesn't want food, he doesn't want water, he wanted a friend. And God reached down and spoke to two men and sent him to Saul to be a friend to a man who desperately needed him. And because of that, the world was changed. The power of friendship. God works in simple ways. And somewhere perhaps today, there's someone that you're thinking of that you can be a friend to. If you answer God's call to be that friend, it might be you who changes the world. Ananias and Barnabas, they had no idea what would become of this man. They didn't know that Saul would become Paul, that would become this great ambassador for Christ. If the goal of a church is to glorify God, that church has to, we have to lovingly accept new people. There's nothing that, that attracts more people to a church than a friendly welcome. Let me give you just three quick things that we can do to help people feel accepted in our church, ways that we can be a friend. Number one, greet new people at every service. There ought to be three or four people welcome somebody when they come into the room from the time they walk to the door to the time they sit down. Three or four or five people ought to greet them. Let them know that they're welcome here, that we're excited to have them with us. Secondly, get to know people by name. Learn people's names. I know that can be difficult sometimes, but, but people enjoy it when they're called by their name. Learn their name. Introduce yourself. Be a sponsor. That's what Barnabas was for Saul. You say, you know, should I really make everybody feel welcome though? What about people who are living contrary to God? What about this guy, Saul? <laughs> He's persecuting the church. He's killing Christians. When a church has an accepting spirit along with faithfully preaching the word of God, the people who come in, they'll either change or they'll leave. Loving people is our part. Changing them is God's part. And through the preaching of the Word of God, they're responding to the Holy Spirit working. God will begin to change inside of them. So new church members, new Christians, especially those like Saul, they're needing to make major lifestyle changes. They need to feel accepted. We can't expect new Christians to act and behave like mature believers, can we? They're brand new. But as they hear God's Word taught, they'll begin to grow. They'll begin to mature. And God's Word has awesome power. Remember in the, in the book of Isaiah it says this, my, my word that goeth forth out of my mouth, it shall not return void, but it shall accomplish that which I please, and it shall prosper in the thing whereto I sent it. We need people like Barnabas who will come alongside visitors, new believers, new members, and be encouragers. We need more Barnabases in the church who make people feel accepted, who will give words of encouragement, rejoice in their spiritual growth, reconcile them when they stumble, when they fall, be there to help pick them up, put an arm around them. And God is glorified and blesses churches that have members like Barnabas. What can you do personally today, beginning today, to help in that area? It's friend day. We're talking about being a friend. The power of friendship, we see that maybe through a little different lens as we look at the life of Saul there today. We're going to go ahead and dismiss early this morning, just kind of give you an opportunity to be a friend this morning, talk with people around, be there to greet visitors. We're expecting visitors as they come through this morning. So extend a warm handshake to them, a smile on your face, greet them this morning. We've got coffee, donuts, juice in the back. 
So be sure to help yourselves to that. Amen. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for this time this morning as we uh, just briefly looked at, at the uh, life of Saul here, his conversion encounter. And Lord, we see how you use these two men, Ananias and Barnabas, uh, as a friend when Saul had no other friends. And God, I pray that this morning that we would understand that uh, here in this church that we need to be like Barnabas. We need to encourage new believers, uh, visitors as they come in. Lord, I pray that you would uh, bless us, bless the efforts uh, that have been put into Friend Day. Give us a great service this morning in Jesus' name. Amen.